thanks for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I advance. Oh. <laughs> oh, here it is. Is that it? Uh, there's no most efficient button. There's a mouse right there. Where do you think you just push the button on that? I think the keyboard. Keyboard? Yeah, the keyboard okay. arrow. There you go. So I just want to acknowledge some folks before I start. They have done all the work here. These are students that work in my lab. Morgan Wilming is a current PhD student, graduate student. Yeah. Hopefully that's gonna keep popping up. Uh Chin Gua Guan Chu. Uh, former graduate student in my group and uh, is currently back in China, graduated, he's back in China working in. Maria Nunez, an HHMI scholar, undergraduate. And uh, these three did all the work that, that I'll present today, so they deserve a lot of credit on this and discussions with ideas and whatnot towards this. So essentially we study contaminants uh, and how they affect a valued ecosystem component or response or something in the ecosystem that you put a value on. And that's pretty much the framework of ecotoxicology. In reality, what we have in the environment around that are all kinds of other, other stressors, um, <clears throat> many of which modify contaminant toxicity, bioavailability, things like that. So for example, things like temperature are directly related to climate change. These are variables that are already out there and can interact with contaminants. So essentially we have a multi-stressor system as a default, pretty much. Uh, and what we focus on, or what I'll present today is, the, specifically temperature, how things might change under climate change, and how that could be related to how contaminants affect biotic resources. So essentially, what we're interested in is t daily temperature variation. This could be a significant driver for uh, contaminant toxicity, and then assessment of risk for toxicity could be influenced by that. So how we understand how contaminants affect resources in the environment could be directly related to this temperature variation. Mechanistically, you can envision all kinds of issues, physiological changes. These things can directly influence contaminant processes such as uptake rates and toxicokinetics, how chemicals move around in an organism. It has been, people have been working on temperature dependent toxicity across the board with contaminants, metals and organics, since probably the 70s. And no one really has really looked at daily temperature cycles or this variation and how that relates to that system. So historically, most of the work has been done with uh, ranges of constant temperatures. And we see two papers here, this, this one down here by De Lorenzo uh, is effects of uh, chlorothalonil on grass shrimp, and we see a dose response curve here at a low temperature and then at a high temperature, and we see a shift. So at higher temperatures, this chemical is much more toxic. Okay? Up here we see similar uh, work with pyrethroids, uh, Don Weston's work, and this demonstrates how they develop these relationships. It's constant temperature, so they do an exposure for maybe 10 days, or however long the period is at 12 degrees, 17 degrees. But then they determine that there's a temperature relationship there. And these are all pyrethroids. Notice that there's greater toxicity at lower temperatures. This is LC50, so the lower the LP, LC50, the greater the toxicity. What we're interested in is this temperature variation. And um, so our group's focus is kind of broken up into four different phases. The first is, comparing this variable temperature over a 24-hour period to a constant temperature. And what is the toxic response? The second phase, which we're in the process of working on, is looking, throwing a little more complexity into that and looking at sediments. And so more uh, potential variation in bioavailability and how does temperature, the role of temperature variation compared to the constant temperature, how does that play out with, with a more complex system? Uh, this phase three, which Morgan is currently working on, um, is basically to look at a variable temperature, and so a low to a high to a low over a 24-hour period, and then what might occur under predicted changes in the future for climate related to temperature. And so if there's a little bit of an increase, how does that affect toxicity and risk to uh, 
uh, aquatic invertebrates. And then finally, which we haven't started on yet, but we plan on looking at this, is understanding what mechanisms might be driving that. Is it changes in uh, the metabolic rate, which affects uptake, or is it changes in detoxification processes that we don't know? That's the next step, basically, to, to look at. So what we did is we basically deployed some of these temperature loggers in a variety of aquatic habitats in the state, or, or different types of habitats throughout Texas. Uh, and here's data from Lost Maples, which is down in the hill country. And we see this is a uh, time over here, so we see over a 24 hour period, about a one degree change in daily temperature. Driven by, and, th and this is actually um, uh, spring fed, so that's probably why this variation is, is so low. But when we look at other places, like uh, South Yano River at Junction, a little bit greater daily, so these are, tw these are peaks over a 24 hour, 24 hour period. So each day this is the high and then a low. So we see around six degrees or so, and this is just, we randomly picked out a couple of peaks here. Up on the Cap Rock, plies a little more variation, urban playa here and agricultural playa here, 18 degrees. That's, that's pretty significant. And uh, back to that Weston paper, they, their constant temperatures, the extremes, the low and the high that they looked at was only 14 degrees, and they found a two, greater than two times difference in toxicity. So that's pretty significant over 14 degrees. And what we experience around this environment up here in Lubbock is in that range. And that's why we're studying this temperature variation. Uh, and this was a blow up of what I just showed two slides previously, this pyrethroid data and so four, about 12 degrees up to so 27 or so, this is about over 14 or 15 degrees centigrade, 105% change in toxicity. Now with this group of compounds, toxicity is, is reducing. The LC50 is getting higher. So this is actually beneficial to some invertebrates. But that's not the case for all chemical classes. There's a lot that have this relationship with toxicity. Are you looking at specific invertebrates? Uh, this, this is not our data, but this is with invertebrates, yes. <coughs> and actually, I'll get, I'm gonna get to what the invertebrates that we're working with in a minute. So what we did was we took this field collected data, came back to the lab, and then built these systems, water bath systems attached to a temperature controller. So we can actually have very um, close control over the temperature and simulate these patterns. And this is essentially what it looks like uh, on the left here, this is field collected data, the black line, and the red line is what we're simul simulating in the lab. So we're trying to match that up as, as well as possible. And the idea is to have a really controlled experiment and we're just changing temperature, just to see what that temperature roll is. And uh, on the right here is what this would look like if we ran it out several days for an exposure. Um, this is a five day cycle, and we see highs and lows throughout that. And this is on a, about a 10 degree variation. So the first, that first phase is to compare a constant temperature to a, a variable temperature. So we had two treatments here, and down here, 24 degrees and 21 to 31 was our variable temperature. And what I want to point out is this, what we try to do is get these means as close as possible. And what these means are is the average, we measure temperature every minute over a 24 hour period, and then take the average, and the average here is 24.1, and the mean for this variable temperature is 24.8. And we wanted to do that because what we wanted to look at is what, what role that variation plays. And so the ranges are over here. About 1.9 degree difference fluctuating up and down. That's something we can't, we can't get rid of. That's probably due to air temperature changes. But the variable temperature range, 20.9 20 to 31.4. So this is what's gonna drive our treatment effect right there. And what we did find with, to answer your question, Hyalella Azteca is one of the organisms we worked with, benthic detritivore. Uh, with this variable temperature pattern versus the constant, we found a um, reduced LC50, meaning greater toxicity, when they're experiencing these peaks and uh, valleys of temperature over time. Uh, about 10 ppb lower. And so we looked at a couple different model, models. Here's a coronament, is a, um, a 
midge, non-biting midge larvae. It's kind of like look, the adults look like mosquitoes. The larvae are aquatic. It's a common testing organism. And we found a significant interaction between bifenthrin, this is a pyrethroid class pesticide, bifenthrin concentration and these two temperature treatments. And then finally, we also looked at a biomarker of exposure, which is colonesterase activity. And this is a biomarker for organophosphate exposures. And so in this model, we used malathion, which is the organophosphate, <coughs> and daphne and magna as the receptor organism, and then looked at this biochemical um, measure. And so we, did, we found a significant, uh, significant effect of the pesticide, malathion, which is expected because it inhibits cholinesterase. So that's why it's a biomarker of exposure. But we also found a <coughs> significant main effect of temperature. There was no interaction effect, but a main effect of temperature increased cholinesterase activity at this variable temperature. And so this could have implications uh, or give us some insight towards the mechanisms. It doesn't tell us a lot about what mechanisms might be driving this, but at least get us in going in certain directions. <coughs> So a second phase was to look at this in a more complex system. So what we did was we, we went out and collected sediments from uh, Lubbock, from flies, and this is a uh, Google Earth image. This is 82nd Street and 98th Street slide in Quaker. And right in the middle of this is uh, Preston Smith Elementary, and then the park and a, and a playa lake in the middle of it, which is the scenario for a lot of flies. One minute one? Okay. Uh, so. We, fig <laughs> we figured that this was uh, uh, probably contaminated sediments because it receives runoff from the surrounding watershed here. And so this is some of that data. And what I want to point out is we, have ten, uh, we threw in another treatment of 10 degrees, and this basically forces toxicity for pyrethroids because they're much more toxic at colder temperatures. And so we did see something that suggested pyrethroid toxicity. And so what I, what I wanted to point out, there's two points here, is that this constant temperature and this variable temperature are pretty close. So that tells us something, that possibly that most of, most of the exposure might be pyrethroids that are used in urban uh, situations. But this is the important thing over here, this uh, Remington Park Lake here. 24 degrees is a standard toxicity testing temperature for risk assessments, permitting, all that. Uh, gov governed documents say we need to do it at a constant temperature. This would not tell us anything about real sediment toxicity in the environment because we have much reduced um, uh, uh, survival at a variable temperature. Probably because we got pyrethroids in the mix, but it's probably a complex mixture of other chemicals that are more toxic at higher temperatures. We don't know what those are. We didn't measure chem in chemistry here. Um, and the third phase is, which Morgan is currently working on for her dissertation, uh, is to look at these variable temperatures, what we see currently, and what might be forecast in the future under potential climate change. And we did, uh, in some preliminary work, we did find the significant interaction effect of temperature and this fungicide, puriclostrobin, kind of a new class of fungicides that are out there, strobins, but a significant interaction of temperature and that and the chemical. And what we're working further on is more ecosystem function related endpoints. These guys shred leaf material and we're looking at that as a response. Okay, so a couple take home messages. Environmentally realistic temperature variation is important. We think that this is this could be very important for understanding risk in the future. Um, and we see differences between and, and especially for Comparing it to constant temperatures in standardized, standardized tests, we're not sure how much information you really get from that using the standardized test. Uh, a second point is that um, the variable temperatures will likely have an effect on pesticides, some classes of pesticides. So this means that future changes in this variable temperature under potential climate change could be important. And then I'd also like to throw this out there that for some species, temperature variation on shorter temporal, sc temporal scales may be most relevant. And we always tend to think that we need to think about things on the long term, but there's a lot of groups of taxa that, at least in the aquatic environment, are using 
the, the aqueous environment for a brief period of time. And uh, especially things like larval amphibians, they might be larval amphibian, or that organism might be a larval form in aquatic environment for four weeks or so. And then it emerges, and then they burrow underground. So looking at, you see a lot of literature that talks about annual minimums and maximums, or even seasonal. Those might not be fully representative of the, temp the temperature variation on the scale that's important to some of these organisms. Um, some of this data we, has been published, or just was published this month, and for any of you prints, uh, you can email Morgan on that. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd like to try to answer them. Great, thank you. We have time for one question. Uh, so, fibroid toxicity is, is decreasing under climate change um, regimes. What could be the implications of, uh, I assume that we have to use more of it, or well, more frequently, or a different class? What would be the implications for you know, using that? Yes, kind of that is the double-edged sword with any of this, <coughs> any of these results. And uh, so, in some of the environments, like here, we do have very high fluctuations. So we st we're still going to get cold temperatures, although that minimum on a whatever scale you're talking about daily might creep up a, a little bit, right? Um, I think that the most conservative thing is not to recommend increasing any sort of use of the chemicals. I, I think from an environmental perspective, <coughs> it's very dangerous. But I could see people using that argument. Uh, so I, I don't know what the, um, the I don't know what the answer is because people will use data however they want to to support a you know a certain goal. So. I don't know. <laughs> That's really interesting, and I think it emphasizes how important um, communication is. Because, I mean, you can throw the facts out there, but people are going to do different things with them, which leads perfectly into our next presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I see why they might yeah. add, add more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but, but maybe they just, uh, maybe they, it won't affect because they add it during the summer months where the temperatures are higher anyway. Um, when do they add fires? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, it would be during the growing season yeah. when there's pests out on the fruit of whatever you're harvesting, cotton in this case here. Or, but but it does bring up a good question about what is the shape of that daily variation in the future? Because I think some people are saying that the high, the lows might increase at a different rate than the highs. And I'm not sure if that's really known exactly what would happen. But yeah. Oh, thank you very Thanks. Much. Great, our next presentation is...